Hello and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be presenting the uh, beginner's guide to the Middle East so that we can understand the complexities and also the political events that's shaping today's uh, Middle East. Also in this program we'll be discussing some of the challenges that Israel faces in a growing hostile environment in which the Arab Spring has really transformed so many Arab societies. We'll be focusing on uh, Egypt and the trouble that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood President Mohamed Morsi is having with a large number of protests against his government in which he's called for a state of national emergency. We'll also be discussing the ongoing conflict in uh, Syria, which actually threatens to bring in so many of the neighboring states into this conflict. And we're discussing Iran's nuclear program, that Iran is on, on the verge of a point of no return in terms of nuclear weapons program. So we'll be trying to make sense of the complexities that uh, is happening in the Middle East, but also then providing analysis and understanding of what's going on. And to answer these questions today, I'm joined by Neil Lazarus from Awesome Seminars. And uh, this is about your third time on the Middle East Report, Neil. So Thank it's you. great to have you back. It's always a pleasure to be back here. Yeah. Uh, can you share with some of our viewers that maybe can't remember, um, or maybe haven't seen all the programs, um, the work that you do and some of the work that you've been involved so in? So uh, I, work, uh, I, I work as a communication uh, advisor and expert trying to help people explain a little bit about what's happening in the Middle East. And I'm also giving analysis uh, to many groups. I, I speak live uh, to over 35,000 people a year in about five countries. Um, trying to make sense out of the complexity of a very uh, uh, large change in the Middle East which is taking place right now. Uh, certainly many major changes taking place. Um, Neil, you have a real gift for communication um, in terms of uh, your understanding of social networking sites, how media works, uh, social media works, and, uh, and what have you. But um, you want to present the uh, beginner's guide to the Middle East. Uh, how do you start and where do you start? I think one of the things which is important is if you look at uh, popular media, uh, you would imagine the whole Middle East crisis is based on the fact that if Israel didn't build a settlement, everything would be okay. What we're seeing here in the Middle East is probably one of the biggest changes in half a century. If you have a look at a map of the Middle East, for example, you will see straight lines everywhere. I, I had an audience from Africa the other day, and they were... Uh, they were laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? They said, uh, wherever there's straight lines, you know, the British and French ones were colonially. What was set up in the turn of the 1900s by the British and French is collapsing. It never made sense. And we're seeing a rebalancing. It's, it's as if, of the Middle East, it's as if someone pressed the restart button. What we've got to see is how the so-called Arab Spring, which is rapidly coming an Islamic winter, is going to affect the region and is going to affect Israel. And uh, you're very much so. Uh, and if you, we actually talk about this re redefining of the Middle East, it's so interesting that so many of uh, Israel's critics refer to Israel as being an artificial creation or a Western colonialization of the Middle East. Um, but we actually see nations like um, certainly Iraq, we look at Syria, we look at Jordan, we look at Saudi Arabia. Many of these nations, aren't they, are artificial creations, certainly after the First World War. I think it's always interesting to try and look at the Middle East or try and imagine the Middle East as, if you like, a three-way sandwich. Uh, on one level, we have to look at what's happening with Israel and its neighbours. On the second level, there's a bigger thing going on, which is between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Iranians, remember, are Shiite. The Saudis are Sunni. There's a battle over the Islamic world. The third level, if you like, of the sandwich would be uh, a super bowel conflict. If America today isn't as strong as it used to be, Europe's collapsing, don't tell the Germans we still need their money, is we today are seeing a total restructuring of the Middle East. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it will be the birth of a superpower in the Middle East, backed by Russia, against Western interests. That's what's at stake. And also, uh, surely we're also seeing the fragmentation upon tribal lines, aren't we? And this is what uh, so much of the Arab Spring has actually been about. And it's all, we're passing now the... Uh, two years since the fall of uh, President Mubarak's regime in Egypt and certainly since the Arab Spring swept across North Africa, including the Middle East. Uh, but it seems to be basing itself on tribal lines. So could we see smaller states 
emerge? Absolutely. If we look at Egypt, if we look at, uh, in particular, Syria, when both those countries finally settled down, we may well see a splitting, especially in the north, in Syria, uh, a splitting of the country because it, it never made sense in the first place. If we're looking at Egypt, um, the best way to understand Egypt is an, a triangle. It's a balance of power between the president, the army, and the people. First round, the army and the people got rid of Mubarak, the president. The army assumed that they could just appoint someone else, because they always done in the past. The people turned around and said, whoa, 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 we want democracy. They have democracy, and by about 1%, they vote in the Muslim Brotherhood, a radical group uh, of Sunni Muslims who believe the whole area should be uh, an Islamic area. What we're seeing now is a backlash against that uh, in Egypt, because it was only a small, by only a small majority, they actually got him to power. So we're seeing a very, uh, very much a struggle for the very soul of Egypt between radical Islamic forces and perhaps more uh, liberal or pragmatic forces. Um, as far as Israel is concerned, uh, the future of the peace process is at stake. As far as America is concerned, Mubarak was an important ally. They thought they could do business with Mus uh, President Morsi. It could have been a mistake. Um, so the battle is now on. I remind you, by the way, that whilst the Muslim Brotherhood is bad, there's worse. Uh, on one hand, uh, Dr. Mursi is being threatened by the, uh, the more progressive liberal groups. On the other hand, he's also being threatened by more radical groups of the Salaf movement. And very much the whole of the Sinai is becoming a target for these groups targeting uh, uh, the Egyptian military. Um, one of the major problems that uh, President Morsi is having, isn't he, is in terms of rewriting the new Egyptian constitution, which many uh, liberals in Egypt, many of the students actually fear that it actually be uh, a blueprint for the Islamification of uh, Egypt, which they feel this will threaten uh, liberals, it will threaten uh, minority groups like the Christians and also the plight of women in Egypt. Absolutely. Uh, and we, 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 as far as the, uh, the uh, constitution is being passed, uh, we're seeing what it, it, it means. It's seeing a move towards a much more radical Islamic state. On the other hand, if you want to be optimistic, and it's always good to see the, car, the, the uh, cup half full, if you like, um, is Morsi still needs American aid. He also has unemployment. He also has poverty. He's got America breathing down his back. He's got Israel breathing down his back. So, so he's not running to create the caliphate right now. Um, so he's got pragmatic problems. If he collapses, you could have absolute chaos in Egypt as well. That's the problem. Uh, it, it, it can always get worse. What we have to see is what's going to happen on Israel's southern border, um, which historically Egypt has been one of the uh, strongest enemies of the state of Israel before 1979. OK, we've got a clip to go to now. Uh, this is the Egyptian president, President Mor Morsi, calling for a state of emergency in Egypt. Following a weekend of violent protests, Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi has declared a 30-day state of emergency and curfew in three major cities that bordered the Suez Canal. The Muslim Brotherhood-led government is also in the process of approving a draft bill to permit the military to deploy and arrest civilians. This latest spate of violence contrasts with previous flare-ups in the level of collaboration we're now seeing between the Brotherhood and the military. But an expectation of growing unrest under deteriorating economic conditions will also serve the military's goal to keep the Brotherhood's political power in check. In spite of the emergency declaration, protests are already breaking the curfew and more mass funerals are expected to transform into riots in the Port Said, Suez and Ismailia provinces, all of which border the Suez Canal. So far, commercial traffic through the canal has not experienced any disruption from the unrest. Anti-Brotherhood protests are also resuming in Cairo. The decision to impose a state of emergency in these areas was not an easy one for Morsi. After all, emergency rule was a tool heavily relied on by the Mubarak regime to sustain authoritarian rule for decades, and so it strikes an emotional chord with much of the populace. However, the track record of riots in Egypt over the past two years shows that Egyptian police and internal security forces have not been capable of quelling unrest on their own. Once again, Morsi has had to turn to the military for help. This exposes the Brotherhood's undeniable dependency on the military to control a highly polarized state and thus gives the Egyptian armed forces leverage to politically contain the Muslim Brotherhood. The pressure on the Morsi government is also bound to escalate as the government struggles to negotiate a $4.8 billion loan with the IMF. 
On the one hand, the loan is urgently needed to stem the precipitous decline of the Egyptian pound and drain on government coffers to defend the currency. On the other hand, the conditions attached to that loan are going to require cuts in subsidies and hikes in taxes that will only fuel more unrest. Morsi has tried to get around these constraints by delaying the loan, reshuffling his cabinet, and calling for yet another dialogue with the opposition. But none of these moves will allow him to avoid the inevitable and additional pain that is to come from austerity measures. Morsi will first have to get past the unrest associated with the anniversary of the uprising and hold his new cabinet together to finalize a deal with the IMF. The military, meanwhile, has no interest in removing Morsi and inheriting the many ailments afflicting the country. It's useful for now to have the Muslim Brotherhood absorb the blame, but that, too, will carry consequences. The Brotherhood is still the largest and most popular political party in the country, but the more the population becomes disillusioned with Brotherhood rule, the more that could benefit fringe political parties. That includes Egypt's faction of Salafist jihadists, including the Nur Party, which won 25 percent of seats in Egypt's lower parliament in the last election. While divisions among the Salafist groups weaken the bloc overall, they are making an effort to unify ahead of the next election scheduled for this spring. From the military's point of view, it would much rather deal with the Muslim Brotherhood than with a far more politically intractable group on either extreme of the political spectrum. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, Neil, we saw in that clip, which was uh, incredibly informative and uh, do very good work at Stratfor Intelligence, um, that, that really there is real resentment beginning to grow against uh, President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, you, you talked about the challenges earlier that he faces, but can he survive and uh, can the state of Egypt survive? Uh, they're talking about state of national emergency, even social and economic collapse in Egypt. Um, he can possibly survive, but it's going to be a struggle. I remind you, he's got the army down his back, uh, um, breathing down his back at the same time. They're interested in um, maintaining their power, their support from uh, America, and we're seeing America continuing the support uh, with the army. We're also... Uh, he. I remind you, it's not only uh, uh, from the more progressive anti-Muslim groups. The Salaf movement's also breathing down his back. His economy, as the clip suggested, is disastrous. On the other hand, what's going to happen? Um, Morsi is important to Israel because he also provides a channel to talk to Hamas. Now, at the moment, um, and we've seen, by the way, that Morsi had um, uh, helped uh, a ceasefire, bring a ceasefire with the last Gaza war. So, so he is important to that extent. What happened recently today is that Ahmadinejad came for the first time since 1979 to Egypt. I remind you, Egypt's Sunni, uh, the Iranians are Shiite. But despite that, Ahmadinejad is feeling that he's trying to get a bridge of Islamic groups to encircle Israel. He's trying, and again, it's, it's important, it's historic, it made a small headline. When Ahmadinejad comes, it's for the first time saying, look, despite our differences, despite the arguments we've had, we can do business together. If that's successful, you then have uh, a, a circulate, uh, um, Israel on all sides being encompassed by Iranian uh, uh, allies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Syria, they've become more powerful, and now he wants to, 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 to get stronger in Egypt as well. The decision he has to make is which way is he going to go? Will he go with America? Will he go with Iran? He can't stay in the middle. Yeah, we've got a map of the uh, Middle East that uh, we can look at, Neil, and uh, maybe we can talk about the Iranian influence there. We've got the map in front of us there. Right. Uh, we, we see Iran is probably one of the biggest countries there in the region, together with, with Saudi Arabia as well. Um, surely if, for example, the, uh, this relationship blossoms between um, President Morsi of Egypt and Iran, um, won't this cause a, a crisis of confidence for the Sunni nations such as Saudi Arabia and also um, Jordan and Turkey? Well, you know, it's, it's very popular to say that the Sunnis and the Shiites don't like each other, uh, the Saudis versus the Iranians. I agree. But there's one thing which does unite them, which is a hatred towards Israel and a hatred towards Jews. Um, so, for example, Iran will support Hamas. Um, 
it's, it's, it prefers other groups such as the Islamic Jihad, but it will do business with Hamas. Hamas and Hezbollah will do business. Hezbollah is Shiite, Hamas is Sunni. Iran is Shiite, Hamas is Sunni. So they're united in a fight against the West. They're united in a fight against uh, the Jewish people. They're uh, united against Christianity as well. So let's not simplify it. I know it's a beginner's guide. Yes, Sunni, Shiite, everyone knows that there's a problem there. It's more sophisticated, it's more complicated. But if you have a look at that map, I don't know if we can bring that back up, um, there's a bigger threat. If you have a look at uh, where Iran is, and you see that uh, piece of rock going into the bottom of Iran, that waterway there is called the Straits of Hamuz. 37 to 42% of world oil goes through that area. Any military attack on Iranian nuclear sites, Iran will cut off the Straits of Hamuz. That will mean that America will have to act. They've got ships there, by the way, off of Bahrain. They've got the Fifth Fleet. But I pose a question to, you, to your viewers, which is, what happens if an Iranian uh, torpedo hits an American ship and uh, 200 servicemen are killed? Then you have America getting involved. I think that's Obama's nightmare, which is that Israel begins a defensive war against Iran and America's going to get dragged in. But that would be something that uh, President Obama, since his uh, first term in office, and now he's approaching his second term, uh, has been very reluctant to use American military intervention in any conflict around the world. And uh, it looks like at all costs he will try and avoid any conflict with Iran, any conflict with any Middle Eastern state or nation. Um, and, and that's concerning because it's seen, we've seen a decline of American power, but also this reluctance on behalf of the uh, American president to actually be the world's policeman. Well, Obama announced that he's going to be coming to Israel um, for the first time as president. Uh, I wish I was a fly on the wall because it's going to make a very interesting con conversation with Netanyahu. Look, America has a syndrome. Whenever they fight a war, there's a syndrome. Vietnam, the Vietnam syndrome. What was it? Was don't fly halfway around the world to fight communists, you're going to lose. Iraq, the Iraq syndrome. When they lost Iraq, can I say they lost Iraq? When they lost Iraq, what's the syndrome America now has under Obama, which is don't fly halfway around the world to the Middle East to topple any dictator because you're going to get stuck there for 10 years and it's going to bankrupt you. That's Obama. That's Obama. So he's very, very reluctant. Yet on the other hand, are you going to allow Iran to go nuclear? Because if they go nuclear, they're backed by Russia. You have the birth of a superpower, which will be for the first time challenging American hegemony in the region. Is 2013 the year they lost, uh, they lo uh, America will lose hegemony in the region? So huge implications, really. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, um, so many of the uh, Gulf states, for example, rely upon American power and influence, including the Saudis, for protection. So if we see a, a huge decline in Americans' interest and certainly American power in the region, that's only going to push the Gulf states into the arms of the Iranians out of fear. Not so quick. Um, the, uh, in it, the Gulf, the, many of the Gulf states uh, fear Iran as much as they do Israel, by the way. Um, I think actually that they fear more nuclear Iran than they do Israel. Uh, the Saudis, in, for example, in the past have offered Israel a peace plan. Um, so I th what we are seeing is uh, a trepidation as Iran marches towards becoming a nuclear power. All you have to uh, see when you turn on the television one day and you see breaking news story, and it says, underground nuclear test by Iran, the world's a different place. I remind you, in Israel, we've heard it before. President Bush said, this dictator won't go nuclear. He was talking about North Korea. On the day the North Koreans got nuclear uh, 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 capability, Israel saw that they couldn't rely on America alone. Yeah, so certainly that happened during uh, Clinton's administration right. uh, uh, as well. And uh, one of the great dangers, isn't it, of uh, Iran acquiring nuclear weapons is it becomes a game changer in the Middle East um, because it will lead to a proliferation of nuclear weapons in the region. Uh, the Egyptians, the Saudis, uh, the Turks, then wanting to develop their own nuclear weapons, which is the, and the Middle East is the most dangerous volatile region of the world, which increases the likelihood of uh, nuclear weapons getting hands into the hands of dangerous terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda or others to carry out attacks around the world. Well, we uh, absolutely, that's absolutely the case. On a uh, less dramatic level, but as problematic, is the situation with Syria, 
what is the problem with Syria is as the regime collapses, we're seeing the weapons of uh, chemical capability and biological capability could fall into the hands of either Hezbollah or the opposition. And I remind you, I know a lot of the popular press is showing the opposition as just victims of Assad. You do have victims. You have 650,000 refugees today. You have over 70,000 people killed in Syria. There's victims of the regime. But many of the people fighting the regime are also jihadist groups. Many of them are being supported, uh, are coming over from Iraq. Many are affiliated to Al-Qaeda. What happens when they get the weapons of the Assad regime? And we've seen, according to uh, reports in the Western media, that Israel's already taken preemptive uh, uh, strikes to stop that happening. Maybe too little, maybe too late. Uh, we've got a clip to go to now that looks at how um, Israel is believed to be responsible for attacking a convoy of uh, anti-aircraft missiles that were on their way to Hezbollah from Syria. Israel's defense minister Ehud Barak has given a strong hint that his country was behind an airstrike on a Syrian convoy last Wednesday that was carrying anti-aircraft weapons believed to be bound for the militant group Hezbollah in Lebanon. I, I cannot add anything to what you have read in the newspapers about the, uh, the, what happened in the, uh, Syria several days ago, but I keep telling, uh, frankly, that we said and. That's one another proof that when we say something, we mean it. We say that we, uh, we don't think that it should be allowable to bring uh, advanced weapon systems into, uh, into Lebanon. Barack made the comments at a gathering of diplomats and defense officials in Munich, Germany. Syrian government television broadcast images of what it claimed was the aftermath of the Israeli airstrike that Syria says targeted a research center near Damascus. Reportedly, the airstrike destroyed cars, trucks, and military vehicles. Barack said Syria's government had a precarious hold on power and predicted Syrian President Bashar al-Assad would soon fall from power. I should admit I'm worried by all things you, you have mentioned. Most imminent and immediate is the coming fall, I hope, of uh, Assad, uh, young Assad from uh, power. This will be a major blow to the Iranians and to the Hezbollah as well. Uh, that is going to happen imminently. Speaking at the same conference, Iranian Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Salehi said that Israel could not afford to ignore his country and that Tehran is ready for talks that would stabilize the region. We have no red line for negotiations, bilateral negotiations, when it comes to negotiating over a particular subject. If the subject is the nuclear file, yes, we are ready for negotiation, but we have to be, to make sure this time, and this is, I think, very fair of us to, to uh, make sure that the other side this time comes with a uh, authentic intention. Whether we like it or not, whether anybody recognizes it or not, we are a regional player. And I would like to say we are the golden key to the region. But Barack said Iran's support of Hezbollah was part of a wider policy by Tehran to destabilize the region and proof Iran was not interested enough in peace. How the, these guys in Iran, the, the, Supporting him, or probably we can understand, they supported him and the Hezbollah supported him, and they will suffer, both will suffer a major blow. We have to At the same conference, the Vice President Joe Biden said the United States was prepared to talk directly to Iran, but he said Tehran must show it is serious and that Washington won't engage the Iranians unless talks with them could produce useful results. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, Neil, uh, th there's so much to uh, take and ask regarding the clip we just saw. So I'll firstly start off with Syria before we go back on to the Iranian issue because um, Syria is so interesting because it's become a battleground for regional players in the Middle East. And um, certainly uh, Syria and its pres uh, beleaguered president, Bashar al-Assad, is a client of the Iranian regime. Uh, we've known that according to Israeli and other uh, American 
American intelligence being reported that the Iranian Revolutionary Guards are backing up uh, Assad's regime uh, in his uh, bloody clampdown against the uh, Syrian people. Uh, we're also seeing how Turkey is also concerned about what's happening in Syria. And so many of the uh, Syrian refugees are flooding into Turkey. Um, they've installed um, Patriot missiles in Turkey and also in Jordan now, I believe. Um, and also the Russians are very keen to preserve Bashar al-Assad's hold on power as uh, Syria is a very useful naval base and client of the uh, Russian regime. Uh, and also that the West is concerned. So, uh, And also Israel is very concerned that the trouble in Syria could actually spill into Israel's territory. So, so much going on. Uh, and it seems that Syria is really a, a focal point for that battle between Sunni and Shia, even though in many cases so many uh, Sunni terrorist organizations work with the Iranian regime. Well, I, I, I remind you the uh, uh, regime is an Alawite regime. Um, what you do have, though, as you suggested, is that Iran is is backing uh, the Alawite regime of, um, uh, of Assad. Again, it's creating a battlefield against the West. It's creating a battlefield against Israel and America. You know, it's, it's interesting. When um, Iran calls uh, Israel the little Satan, they mean it. They see the Israel as a, a, a manifestation of evil. By the way, if there's a little Satan, there's a big one. <laughs> and it's America, Britain, uh, and the West, and Europe. So the threat of Iran is not a threat against uh, Israel. It's, it's a global threat. It's a threat against the West, because they see the West as being anti-Islamic. I encourage people to read. Read what they're uh, saying, listen to what they're saying, and believe them. Uh, Netanyahu said once, and I, I, I agreed with him, is the... Uh, you know, when anti, the lesson of the, of the Holocaust is, is one thing. When people say they want to kill you, believe them and stop them. Iran today is a threat. It's using Syria and it's moving into Syria uh, as, as a, a proxy. The threat of a war in the next six months, in the next year, is coming from the northern border. It's coming from Syria, which could drag in uh, Hezbollah, could uh, drag in uh, uh, Lebanon as the regime collapses. And that brings in uh, Iran, brings in Russia, maybe America as well. Yeah. And we've got a clip to go to now. And uh, this is an Israeli warning to the, uh, 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 the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, in terms that she's now reaching a threshold in terms of developing uh, nuclear weapons. And this is Israel's warning to Iran. Israel has warned Iran against plans to install advanced uranium enrichment operations. The warning came as Iran announced plans that would allow it to significantly speed up activity that the West fears could be used to develop a nuclear weapon. The announcement by the Iranians that they have upgraded their nuclear enrichment demonstrates clearly that despite the diplomacy and despite the sanctions, the Iranians nevertheless continue their aggressive pursuit of a nuclear weapon. The international community must unite before it's too late. We simply cannot afford a nuclear-armed Iran. Israel and Western states are wary of Iran's nuclear ambitions, although Tehran says its plans are entirely peaceful. Hello and uh, welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, and Neil, we saw in that clip there that uh, Israeli concerns that uh, Iran is very, very close to developing nuclear weapons. It's believed in the matter of between maybe even four and six months until they actually have the bomb. Um, how much will Iran having the bomb change the Middle East? It's going, um, it's going, sorry, it's not going to just change the Middle East, it's going to change the world. This isn't a Middle East problem, it's a global threat. The world has always been based uh, on this idea of mutually assured destruction. I have nuclear weapons, you have nuclear weapons, we're not going to use them because no one wants to die. What happens if you have a regime which believes that jihad is a legitimate form of combat because it guarantees a greater place in heaven and is about to get the capability to destroy the uh, state of Israel? That's the problem. It's a, my, it's a change in mind shift. Um, how people think in global paradigms, the threat today is not just to Israel. It's a global threat. 
We're the little Satan. Britain and America's the big one. Because mm. um, when, when we looked at uh, uh, the previous conflict, if we go back to the battle between capitalism and communism between the United States and the Soviet Union, both Russia and the United States have nuclear weapons. They still have nuclear weapons. But the, the reason why we didn't have a nuclear conflict in the Cold War was primarily because of the Russian and American policy of MAD, mu uh, mutually, mutually assured, assured destruction. destruction. And in this case, this doesn't apply, does it? MAD doesn't apply here. And again, it's, it's, it's always looking at the last war to try and understand what's going on now. The reality today is you have a regime who believes in the coming of the Majdi who is going to be preceded by days of catastrophe and they're getting nuclear weapons to prepare for this coming of the Majdi. Uh, and they see Israel and the West as evil in the world. If you have a look at the ideology, the religious understanding of the radical Shiite regime, and it's radical even within uh, Shiaism, they believe that Israel and America is evil and is a personification of evil in the world today. Uh, that's the problem. You've got to leave mad. Mad doesn't apply. Okay? This is a totally different ideological religious threat. Uh, and uh, it seems very much, um, I, according to my notes here, uh, on the February the 26th, um, the EU, headed up by uh, Lady Baroness Ashton, is uh, meeting with um, Iran's negotiator to negotiate and talk about Iran's nuclear weapons program. Um, and what concerns me is that, um, uh, sorry, Baroness Ashton's comments that these talks are very constructive. You want me to say something constructive about Ar uh, Baron, uh, Baroness Ashton? You can say what you like. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure she'll come out. She'll come out with a white piece of paper. Europeans never learn from the history of Europe. Uh, it's the uh, European, uh, the Europeans are trying to appease yet again uh, someone who is calling for the destruction of the West. When will they learn from history? These are people who are playing for time. The only thing the Iranians need is time. Keep talking, keep talking, keep talking, and then one day you'll turn on the television, underground nuclear explosion, test successful, backed by Russia, the world's a different place. But haven't we seen over the last um, few years a lot of uh, covert uh, operations inside Iran to actually target Iran's nuclear facilities? Even there's a talk only a couple of weeks ago about an attack on an underground Iranian nuclear plant in which is believed over 240 um, workers who are working on that plant have been killed. We've had the uh, Cymex computer virus system that's uh, taken down and delayed the enrichment of uh, uranium uh, process. Um, but what would it mean if the world is silent and Israel has to go alone and take out Iran's nuclear facilities? Surely that would make Israel's situation in the Middle East and in the Western world even more precarious and dangerous. Well, you have a problem. Uh, I, I agree with you, first of all, that there has been uh, war by other means, uh, by a number of different countries, including those things you uh, listed, uh, uh, viruses, uh, attempts at um, attacking nuclear scientists, etc., explosions in nuclear um, uh, reactors, so on and so forth. All of that is there. There's a problem, which is there's an assumption that Israel can do it alone. And if you listen carefully to some of the lead, uh, quotes coming out from the leadership in Israel today, there's been reference that Israel can't just do it alone. Look, there's a problem. If Israel was to attack Iranian nuclear sites, the likelihood is it would only set them back two years. It could set back the Israeli, uh, Israeli economy 10, 15 years because it would involve an attack from Hezbollah, it would involve an attack from Iran, it would involve a, an attack from a weakened Hamas. You've got jihadists in the Sinai. That's a lot of ammunition coming our way, together with the closing of the, uh, of the uh, Straits of Hormuz we mentioned. Do you allow Iran to go nuclear? Do you trigger a regional conflict? Those are the questions of our time that we have to decide. And there's no good choices. Hopefully, if sanctions can be uh, placed, maybe they'll work. But all options are on the table. The trouble is, it's a very fragile table. And, and the regime is determined to uh, develop nuclear weapons. Maybe one way of looking at um, Iran is also to recognise that Iran, unlike the other states in the Middle East, um, has a history that can pre over thousands of years. Um, and so, therefore, they're a legitimate 
nation, a legitimate country with an ancient culture, uh, very sophisticated people. Uh, I wonder the danger that if the uh, Israelis or with the help of the British and the Americans decide to target Iran's nuclear facilities, then it would just rally the people behind what is a very, very unpopular uh, and unliked government in Tehran. Absolutely. Um the regime doesn't represent his people. The, um, ironically, uh, the Iranian population is a very young population. Uh, some, something like 70% is um, around the age 30. It's very modern. It's very progressive. Um, and it's a radical leadership, which is out of uh, touch with its own people. I think that is a danger. Um, if you have a look at military action Israel took against Gaza, it ignited the um, Islamic world against Iran. We could have a much bigger problem on our hands. Mm. And what does the challenges Israel face? I, I mean, I'm trying to understand this uh, probably in my simplistic way I can of what's really happened. Now, I believe that there's been two fun fundamental events that have really shaped this. One was the war in Iraq in uh, 2003, which thankfully saw the removal of uh, an evil dictator in Saddam Hussein, but really allowed Iran to take hold of uh, Iraq as a state, and, and also the spread of democracy that uh, many of the America in the American Bush administration um, believed that democracy could take root in the Arab world because the Islamists would be against democracy. Instead, they used democracy and the ballot uh, box to come to power and reshape the region. Absolutely. Uh, democracy has been the tool by which is, uh, the Islamic groups have become more powerful. Um, it's a bit like uh, you know, a bottle of Coke or a fizzy drink and so someone shook it and they've taken off the lid and everything's coming out. I actually don't think that today the Middle East can be understood as Israel and the Arab world. There isn't an Arab world. There's Arab countries and non-Arab countries such as Iran all jostling for position and power. I think it's something else. I think it's a difference between radicalism and a radical Islam, both Sunni and Shiite, uh, versus pragmatism in the Muslim world and uh, uh, with, within Israel as well. That's, that's really uh, the battle of our time. Why Iran became so strong was because Iraq became weaker. Whilst we got rid of Saddam Hussein, which was good, he was an evil dictator, used gas against the Kurds, killed his own people. There was a, a, a balance of power between two countries. Once you got rid of Iraq, Iran became the winner of, ironically, the war on terror. And now it's spreading. And that's the problem. But also, if we look at maybe um, in these societies and in Arab culture as well, we, we've got um, an incredible number of young people. I think the GDP rate is that uh, something like 60, 70 percent of the population in the Arab world is under the age of 70, um, who many of them don't have jobs. We look at the GDP growth rate in the, uh, in the Arab world is probably less than two or three percent, which there's growing resentment. Um, and also we're seeing a fundamental attack on the ancient Christians in the region as well, which with the rise of Islamism is not tolerant of uh, any other minority groups. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and the key of the success of groups such as Hezbollah or the uh, Muslim Brotherhood is to provide aid and to become charitable organizations. People buy into the ideology via food, via uh, money, via uh, aid that these countries, um, that these organizations are, are providing. So I agree with that. Having said that, poverty alone doesn't create um, radicalism because you also need an ideology which can be bought on an intellectual manner. We're seeing some of the most extremists are also university graduates. So it, it's a bit of a simplification, if you like, of... Poverty leads to uh, radical Islam, therefore solve the poverty and everything will be okay. <laughs> Some of the 9-11 bombers, for example, were, were graduates, were middle-class graduates who bought into the ideology and, and were you know, the most extreme that we've seen. But, but yes, it, you know, poverty, I think, does um, breed radicalism, particularly if, it's in, if you have the influence of the indoctrination. Uh, and what we've seen really in the Arab world over the last 20 years is an explosion of uh, anti-Semitism, hatred towards the West on their media, on their education system, uh, and through also very dangerous uh, Islamic imams preaching hatred and violence towards not only Israel and the Jews, but also the West as well. Absolutely. 
You had a question. <laughs> I, I did have a question. So I'm, I'm, I'm in terms of uh, Western leaders, in terms of uh, David Cameron, uh, British Prime Minister, in terms of the European Union, in terms of President Obama, surely one of the way to create a more stable, peaceful Middle East is to look at this whole issue of indoctrination and hatred and the cultural phenomenon that's taking place in the region Absolutely, and to and tackle and this issue. Israel's been at the lead of making the issue of, for example, Palestinian uh, incitement uh, in schools, uh, on television programs, uh, a key issue, uh, especially in Europe. And I think that we're having some success. Having said that, if you look at uh, um, Palestinian um, media, for example, Palestinian Media Watch, oh, uh, which covers it, uh, they are radical organisations. Um, the radical message is still coming across on Palestinian television. Mm. Uh, and I just want to draw things closer to home, uh, talking about your nation uh, your, and uh, the nation of Israel. Now, it seems to me that uh, as we're seeing a rise of uh, Islamic extremism and fundamentalism in the Middle East, we're seeing the collapse of the old traditional artificial Arab states uh, that were created by the colonialist powers of the British and the French, who redrew the Middle East after the First World War. Um, that there's a fundamental battle uh, and fight for the battle of and sovereignty of Jerusalem, not only coming from the Arab world, but also coming from the West as well as the uh, European Union and the United States believe the biggest problem in the Middle East is uh, Jewish people building homes in Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem is, is perhaps the key, the symbolic key of the battle for uh, Israel and the survival of uh, Israel. I saw a BBC reporter there the other day, you know, the British biased corporation. <laughs> She's standing there and she goes, here, Islam and Judaism stand side by side. No, they don't. We're on top of each other. Muhammad goes up to heaven on the most holiest place for Jews. We're not side by side. We're on top of each other. What we're seeing is a choice between a divided Jerusalem and a united Jerusalem. It, between a Jerusalem which is today where everyone, Jews, Christians and Muslims have freedom of a prayer in all the religious sites, or a return to pre-67 where Jews weren't allowed to pray and Christians weren't allowed to pray. Yeah. And we've got a clip to go to now that looks at the uh, battle and the battle for Jerusalem. Jerusalem today stands as the undivided capital of Israel. Those who live here enjoy peace and for the most part, the liberty to worship freely. But is that all about to change? In recent days, the international community has increased its pressure on Israel to divide its capital, insisting that sections of the city known as East Jerusalem be handed over to the Palestinians. In doing so, the international community appears to have aligned itself with current Palestinian demands. The, the, the Palestinian Authority is very clear on its demands. They want an end to occupation. They want the recognition of the 67 borders as the borders between Israel and Palestine. They want their capital, our capital, to be in East Jerusalem. This arrangement would entrust the holiest place of the Jewish people, the Temple Mount, into Muslim, Arab, Palestinian hands. Even though Jerusalem may be holy to Christians or Muslims, it's only holiest to the Jewish people. And for Sunni Muslims, that's their third holiest site today. But when they're up there praying and the loudspeaker goes off calling them to prayer, they all turn south to Saudi Arabia and turn their backs on the Gold Dome. While every Jew in the world is praying towards Israel, and Israel they're praying towards Jerusalem, and Jerusalem they're praying towards the Old City, and in the Old City we're actually praying towards the Temple Mount itself. But is the heart of the contention really about stones and boundary lines? Some Christian leaders in the region seem to think there is a deeper spiritual dynamic at work. You cannot really explain the depth of passions in this region simply uh, in terms of traditional things like borders, refugees, historical shiftings of populations, those kinds of things. I believe that really the battle in the Middle East, the struggle ultimately is a battle for Jerusalem. Within Jerusalem it's a battle for the Temple Mount and on the Temple Mount it's a battle for who will be worshipped and who will reign on God's holy hill. The key place that the, in the scriptures of the Temple Mount as the place of the footstool of God's throne, he says in Ezekiel 43, here I will uh, dwell forever among the Israelites. Ironically, today the Jewish community has little access to their holiest religious site, 
If the Jewish worshiper attempts to pray on the Temple Mount, he will be arrested for provocation. However, even with these limitations, maintaining sovereignty over Jerusalem is a non-negotiable for Jews worldwide. So in any future peace negotiations, you know, Jerusalem is so central to the Jewish people. It's one of those issues that, you know, there's nothing to talk about. It's just too holy to us, too important, too central. We'd, have to, we'd always have to have access to that site. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, Neil, we saw that clip there that looked at the importance and significance of Jerusalem. Now, to the Jewish people, it is the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Absolutely. It's very difficult to explain here in uh, cold London uh, the beauty of Jerusalem. Uh, I, I walk through the streets of Jerusalem every day, uh, and you're walking in the footsteps of the forefathers. Um, Jerusalem is a place where the uh, Jewish people were born in many ways, have uh, walked through the streets. You're walking through the history of the Bible. Um, so yes, of course it's important for Jews, but it's important for anyone who believes in the Bible uh, because you're walking through the places of the footsteps of, of all the leaders of, of, of uh, the world's religions. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Everyone prays for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, and it seems to me it's uh, remarkable that people call for its division, call uh, for it to return to what it was like in 1960, uh, prior to 1967, which was a city which was split, um, and, and there wasn't the religious freedom that we see today. Yeah, uh, And also I know that, uh, for example, uh, Jerusalem has kind of armed a lot of criticism, particularly by the uh, European Union, um, because they're concerned about uh, the the natural expansion of Jerusalem as a city and want to divide Jerusalem between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. Uh, and clearly with Israel's new light rail proves it's absolutely impossible. There's a functioning city. You have the, um, the Arab population of Jerusalem who are living in East Jerusalem want to stay under Israeli sovereignty and the city works between Jews and Arabs and Christians and so many other people that live in Jerusalem. It's a functioning city, it works. So how can they, the West want to impose a division of Jerusalem that would make the city unworkable. I, I totally will agree with you uh, on, on that. Look, th there are issues, like every other city as well. Uh, could there be more investment in East Jerusalem? Absolutely. Could uh, East Jerusalem be improved as well as West Jerusalem? 100%. I remind you, by the way, many of the Arab uh, um, residents of uh, Jerusalem don't get involved in the local municipal elections and therefore pay the price afterwards. If they were to get involved in the municipal elections, that would very much uh, uh, help their standing in, uh, in the city. We have to work towards a united Jerusalem, which is the capital and is important for not only Jews, Christians and Muslims, but as a united uh, Jerusalem where religion is free. So uh, Christians can walk the footsteps of Jesus, uh, Jews can pray at the Western Wall, uh, uh, and Muslims can pray at the same time. That's the beauty of Jerusalem today. People say it's under Israeli control. Israel's given the freedom of all of the religions to practice in Jerusalem. And, uh, and I invite your, your uh, viewers to come, come to Jerusalem and walk through. Uh, you know, it's the only place where you can use your bi the, the Bible as a, a tour guide. That's what I love about Jerusalem. Yeah, I mean, I love Jerusalem. It's a very, very special city. And I, I certainly feel very, very close to God when, when I'm there. And it, I, I love the streets, particularly the old city. Um, I think with less than uh, two minutes or so to the program, uh, Neil, um, how can our viewers get more information about Israel uh, and the Middle East? Because I know you've got apps, you've got Twitter, Twitter, uh, I don't know, what the website, and you've got loads of information. There is so much information out there uh, as far as different newspapers and different things. So what I've tried to do is uh, put it all in one place. So if um, you have an iPhone or if you have an Android, uh, all you have to do is look up Neil Lazarus. Uh, there's my app. And there you can access, I think it's about 500 videos, 200 links. It updates itself every day. So we have uh, an app, the Neil Lazarus app, which is going to link yourself everywhere else. I'm very proud of my app. But uh, it is on uh, both on iPhone and Android. And if you have another phone, you've got to just replace it. You know, they're the leaders. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the apps are the, are the way forward in terms of getting news and getting information, particularly if you've got an iPhone, which I've got as well. You can watch uh, Revelation TV on the iPhone. Are you, I hear you have an app too. Yeah, which is good. It's good. It, so used, to be, it used to be, I, I think, therefore, I am. It's now I am because I have 
have a nap. So uh, that's that's the moral to the story. And uh, just very, very briefly, why is the Middle East so important? You've probably got about 30 seconds. Bottom line is the Middle East, and especially Jerusalem and Israel, is the heart of the world's religions. I invite people to come, be involved in God's holy land. Neil Lazarus, I want to thank you for joining me again on the Middle East Report. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to come. Thank you. And we'll see you in Jerusalem. That sounds good to me. I just want to thank you all for watching today's program. We're going to leave you with a clip. And uh, this was a battle for Jerusalem in which Israel had to break the Arab convoys and the Arab blockade of Jerusalem back in uh, 1948 or around 1949. And again today, there is a, an international battle for the sovereignty and the destiny of Jerusalem. And it's important that we stand with Israel and the Jewish people and we make known to the world that under Israeli sovereignty, uh, Jerusalem is a free city, a freedom uh, that has the freedom of worship for Judaism, Christianity, and also Islam. And, let's that, and let that continue. And let's continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And thank you for watching today's program. Mever beit machzir Ba belwa La netzach zechor na et shmoteinu Shayarot partu baderech el ha'ir Vezidet haderech mutalim meteinu Sheled habarzel shotek Kemorei <laughs> Po shocheni me beyachad, etze veveti feeret, me shurian haruch, ve shem shel almoni. Ba belwat, la netzach zechor na et shmoteinu, shayaro, parzu baderech el ha'in. הדרך מוטלים מתינו, שלד הברזל שותק כמו ראי. מה בלווה לנצח זכור נא את שמותינו, מה בלווה בדרך אל העיר. ואני Ba-be-lo-wa <laughs> לנצח זכור נא את שמותינו, שיירות פרצו בדרך אל העיר, בצידי הדרך מוטלים מתינו, שלד הברזל שותק כמו ראי. בבלוואר לנצח זכור נא את שמותינו, בבלוואט, בדרך אל העיר. יום אביב יבוא, רקפות תפרחנה, אודם כלנית, בהר ובמורד. זה אשר ילך בדרך 
בדרך שהלכנו, לא ישכח אותנו. אותנו בבל וואד, בבל וואד, לנצח זכור לנאה שמותינו, שיירות פרצו בדרך אל הדרך מוטלים מתינו, שלד הברזל שותק כמו רעים. בבל וואט, לנצח זכור נאה שמותינו, בבל וואט, בדרך אל העיר. בבל וואט, לנצח זכור נאה שמותינו, בבל וואט, בדרך אל העיר. 